potentially down into the ocean, and in essence, tap Europa's battery. And when you tap that battery, you've moved from a system that checks one of the requirements for life to a system that checks a second critical requirement for life. And I think this really impacts the way that we consider habitability on Europa. So how should we view this in the big context of European ocean exploration? Uh, I think Louise is the person to address this. Thank you, sorry. Uh, well, this new model is very uh, exciting in many respects because it ties together a lot of loose ends uh, from Europa studies that have spanned most of the last decade. Uh, here in the first slide, I'm showing uh, a figure that uh, represents two previous models for Europa's shell. Uh, the one on the left shows the uh, ocean and the ice shell. The total thickness of this is about 150 kilometers. Uh, but here the shell is depicted as being very thin, maybe only uh, five kilometers or less. And the plumes that you're seeing here would be um, in the ocean. They're hydrothermal plumes from the uh, floor, from where the ocean floor meets the mantle of Europa. Uh, on the right-hand side is a, a depiction of a thicker shell model where the shell here would be about 15 to 30 kilometers. It's not quite to scale. Uh, but the underlying plumes uh, from the ocean floor would impinge on the bottom of the ice shell and would warm it uh, and as such would create plumes within the shell. These are convective plumes, so it's actually um, solid material that is mobilized because it's slightly warmer than the surrounding. So similar to what you would see in a, a saucepan of bubbling soup. I'm told miso soup does this very well. Uh, but you can see different convection cells and material moves upwards in the center and down at the margins. And these two models have been um, used to explain some of the observations we've seen on the surface of Europa. Uh, but neither of them have been able to explain everything we see. And that's been a big problem for us. Uh, but with the new model that Brittany and her colleagues have put together, we can now explain pretty much every geological observation that we see surrounding chaos on Europa. So it's really sort of come along and, and joined together a lot of dots. So we're, we're very happy uh, to see that. Um, next, I want to talk about the distribution uh, of chaos and its age. Um, if you look at this image uh, of Europa, you can see that uh, the surface looks very different from, say, the surface of uh, the Moon or Mercury, um, those bodies are very heavily uh, impact cratered. They've got a lot of cratering scars on them. Uh, whereas Europa, you can see, has uh, hardly any. In fact, I'm not sure you can even make any out at this scale. Now, we use the number of impact craters on the surface of a body as a proxy for age. We assume that things like comets and meteorites that are coming into a system impact the surface on a fairly constant basis. And so if something has a lot of them, that means that it's been sitting there getting this uh, weathering process for a very long time. Whereas if something doesn't have many craters, it's probably very young. And in the case of Europa, something has happened to erase the impact scars from the surface. Uh, and in this case, uh, it could be tectonic features, so faults and fractures on the surface that could uh, erase whatever has come before. It could be some kind of cryovolcanism, and it certainly could be chaos. So if we can start the movie, please. Um, and in fact, the average age of Europa is thought to only be about 60 million years. Now, on human timescales, that's a very long time. But in geological timescales, that's a blink of an eye. It was almost born yesterday on the surface. Um, so Europa already has a very young uh, surface age. And here we're zooming into um, Thera Macula on the left, which Brittany uh, talked about earlier, and uh, a chaos very close to it, Thrace Macula on the right. And as you can see, they're both quite large. Uh, Thera is about 80 kilometers, maybe a little over 50 miles across. Um, and notice that these are very different from their surroundings. They're both very dark. They have uh, unusual scalloped margins. Uh, they don't look like a lot of the long linear features that we see that appear to be faults and fractures. And these two arrows are pointing towards a semicircular uh, fracture system uh, that was once intact. We're looking at the two sides of it. And you can see that Thrace Macula on the right has actually uh, disrupted the middle of that. It's completely destroyed it, in fact. And so this shows that this chaos region overlies those tectonic features, and so it's much younger. So what we're showing here is not only uh, is Europa's surface young, but chaos is very young still. And in fact, it's one of the youngest uh, feature types, if not the major young landform on the surface. So it's very, very young. Here I'm just uh, zooming out, showing you the equator. Um, there's a big X uh, just off the center to the left, uh, just to the south of that is Connemara chaos, which Brittany also mentioned earlier. But you can see all this brown mottled material over the surface. All of that is chaos terrain. It's very widespread. Um, in fact, we think, you know, estimates vary 
uh, because we don't have particularly good imaging data of much of Europa, but we think it could be as much as 50% of the surface has been completely destroyed in recent times by this chaos formation. And so to summarize, um, this is a very important result because first of all, it draws together many of the conflicting observations uh, that we've seen in the last 10 years. Um, but secondly, it shows that there could be these huge hidden lakes in Europa's shell, uh, widespread bodies of water maybe taking up as much as half of the upper shell of Europa. And so chaos regions are, are going to be extremely important as possible future targets for exploration. And with that, I'll pass back to Dwayne. Thank you. Thank you all. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to start here with a question. And if you can wait for the microphone and give your name and affiliation. And then we'll uh, go to the phone lines. Sir? Randy Showstack, reporter with EOS, a newspaper of the American Geophysical Union. Um, this is very interesting information. And so I, I guess I have sort of a basic question. I'd appreciate if you could um, describe further uh, the other models that you um, uh, investigated and explored and perhaps discarded. Uh, what are the weaknesses in those models for describing Europa? And do you believe that the model that you've uh, outlined today is the only model that now is useful in uh, describing Europa sufficiently? Or could there potentially be other models uh, that might be useful here? Well, certainly. Um, <clears throat> for a long time, we've thought that chaos terrain is formed in the presence of some amount of water. Uh, one of the key unknowns is how you get those surfaces like Connemara Chaos to actually produce domes up above the surface. It's actually very hard to do with most models. Uh, there have been a couple of models suggested. I'll highlight two of them. One is that you completely melt the ice shell um, and that, that the matrix material represents places where liquid water flowed on the surface. That has some problems just because of the cold surface temperatures of Europa and because other observations of Europa suggest that the shell is incredibly thick. Um, on the other hand, there's been models of convection and diapurism where the goal was to try to look at if plumes could survive up into the surface ice to cause that doming. Well, if you relax that constraint and think about what happens when ice actually gets heated, is it melts. And so, in fact, the opposite of what, what originally was the goal happens. And that, as the ice melts, it contracts and causes the surface to depress. But what that also does is it gives a chance for the surface to break up, to fracture, just like ice shelves on the Earth. Why that's important is that we see icebergs on Europa seem to follow pre-existing lines, fractures that already existed. So it's like it's being opened up from the bottom Water's getting in there and breaking off those chunks of ice. When you do that, you mix up all the other stuff. We mentioned a mosh pit of ice earlier. As those big, strong icebergs move around, they can break up all of the weak ice in between, which can fill with water, still not be liquid, but fill with water. As you freeze that out, the expansion happens again. So just as the ice, when it melted, caused thermal contraction, when it refreezes, it causes thermal expansion. And that gives you the extra boost needed to kind of pop that surface back up into a dome. Because you've entrained uh, salt-rich water into that matrix material, creating that kind of lumpy texture on the surface. So it's not the only model that's out there, but one of the exciting things about it is that it does kind of explain why we see icebergs, which might seem to, think, seem to make you think that the ice shell is thin, but also this matrix material in these domes, which indicate the ice shell is thick. OK, let's go to the phone lines. And we're going to head out to the West Coast with David Perlman from the San Francisco Chronicle. David? Hey, thanks very much. Uh, just two questions quickly. Uh, one is, and NASA seems to have placed a priority in the search for life on, life on these uh, Jovian moons and others. And uh, Enceladus and Titan seem to be the higher priority targets. Are you people making a pitch for uh, uh, more attention being paid to Europa? Uh, and if so, how do you make that pitch besides uh, a, a forum like this? And incidentally, is this theory about chaos terrain uh, being published, or has it been published in the literature? And I'll take the answer right now. Well, 
I think what we're saying is that Europa continues to be an interesting priority uh, for exploration, which it has been for, for 30 years or more. Um, yes, the, the paper has been published. Um, it was just released, advanced online publication by Nature uh, today, and will appear in the print version um, of the magazine next week. Can I just add to that? Um, the, uh, the National Academy of Sciences uh, published a decadal survey for uh, exploration, which uh, was the science community giving NASA its suggested priorities for exploration over the next decade. Uh, and I was actually part of the satellites panel that looked at both Titan and Europa. And they are both considered to be extremely important targets uh, and both have astrobiological potential for different reasons. Uh, but at this time, uh, that panel felt that Europa uh, was more compelling, partly because uh, Titan does need some technology development uh, to do certain types of missions there. So they are both very important targets, but at this time it was felt that uh, you know, the recommendation from that panel was that perhaps Europa uh, was uh, of a higher priority at the moment. Okay, I actually have uh, two questions here. The first one is for uh, Brittany from one of the dot coms and then for Tom Wagner. So the, the question is very simple. What are the next steps with uh, presenting this in the data that you have now? I'm, I'm glad to answer that question. Um, for us, the next steps with understanding chaos formation and whether this lake model really is correct is to look at the entire surface. There's still data to be used uh, in the Galileo archives um, that we can use to compare this model to other models and really rigorously test it. And then, um, and then we'll be ready to go on and test hypotheses in the future with exploration. And for Tom, the other question from one of the uh, dot coms. As, as the Earth scientists, uh, personally, what are your feelings on, on, on what you're seeing here and how it relates to your research? Oh, I think it's fantastic. You know, we don't have that many of these examples even on the Earth of ice shelves collapsing. So anytime we can go and see something like this, and also the scale is tremendous. You know, that's one of the things, the Europa scale is a little bit bigger, but that in the future may be something that's more relevant to us here on Earth. So I think it's an exciting research example for us to continue to work together on. Do we have any other questions here? Go ahead. Yeah, I guess I'd just like to follow up on that last question that, that was asked in your response. Um, um, during your presentation, you talk a lot about what the Earth might uh, help us to, how, how the Earth might help us to understand Europa. If you can uh, elaborate a little bit more on how Europa might help us to understand more about Earth processes. Yeah, sure. You know, one of the big things is we're, we're kind of in a new state on the planet, you know, and when we try to understand, say, the Pine Island area, and we try to understand that large, large, large ice shelf and how it's going to interact with the, uh, with the ocean, how, like, one of the theories right now is this, that you've got, um, lack of sea ice and anomalous winds blowing warm water up onto the continental shelf around Antarctica, and that's causing the ice shelves to thin, and that's causing some of them to destabilize and break up. Well, we've seen that happen, but we've only seen it happen right now in kind of small places around the fringe. How is it going to happen in bigger places? You know, what's going to happen as that warm water gets in deeper? And so something that we're going to get are just simple things even like geometric constraints, right? Like, you know, what's going to happen to a really thick area as it breaks up? And something that I didn't talk that much about, the Wilkins ice shelf that I showed first, the reason for show, that's so interesting is that it was kind of mechanical breakup in that the ice shelf had flowed out, and as it flows out in the ocean, it gets thinner and thinner and thinner. Just, like I say, picture it like spreading pancake batter. You know, it just gets thinner as it goes out. And then eventually it destabilizes and breaks up, and it triggers. With the Larsen ice shelf case, one of the theories is that you had surface melting. So you had warming of the surrounding area, water formed, and then kind of like the Europa example, except kind of in the reverse way, that water percolated down, forced its way through cracks, created cracks, destabilized the ice shelf, and it could break apart along those things. So there's, you know, those are kind of two end member cases that we're trying to test between, and Europa is now another example for us to think about. Okay. What we're going to do is, uh, actually, they've done such a great job uh, explaining it. Uh, we have no further questions on the line, although we have numerous media that are listening in. So I want to thank you all for joining us. Obviously, information, go to www.nasa.gov. And thanks for joining us. Science never sleeps. Shell. 
Uh, the one on the left shows the uh, ocean and the ice shell. The total thickness of this is about 150 kilometers. Uh, but here the shell is depicted as being very thin, maybe only uh, five kilometers or less. And the plumes that you're seeing here would be um, in the ocean. They're hydrothermal plumes from the uh, floor, from where the ocean floor meets the mantle of Europa. Uh, on the right-hand side is a, a depiction of a thicker shell model where the shell here would be about 15 to 30 kilometers. It's not quite to scale. Uh, but the underlying plumes uh, from the ocean floor would impinge on the bottom of the ice shell and would warm it uh, and as such would create... ...potentially down into the ocean and in essence tap Europa's battery. And when you tap that battery, you've moved from a system that checks one of the requirements for life to a system that checks a second critical requirement for life. And I think this really impacts the way that we consider habitability on Europa. So how should we view this in the big context of European ocean exploration? Uh, I think Louise is the person to address this. Thank you, sorry. Uh, well, this new model is very uh, exciting in many respects because it ties together a lot of loose ends uh, from Europa studies that have spanned most of the last decade. Uh, here in the first slide, I'm showing uh, a figure that uh, represents two previous models for Europa age. We assume that things like comets and meteorites that are coming into a system impact the surface on a fairly constant basis. And so if something has a lot of them, that means that it's been sitting there getting this uh, weathering process for a very long time. Whereas if something doesn't have many craters, it's probably very young. And in the case of Europa, something has happened to erase the impact scars from the surface. Uh, and in this case, uh, it could be tectonic features, so faults and fractures on the surface that could uh, erase whatever has come before. It could be some kind of cryovolcanism, and it certainly could be chaos. So if we can start the movie, please. Um, and in fact, the average age of your eight plumes within the shell, these are convective plumes, so it's actually um, solid material that is mobilized because it's slightly warmer than the surrounding. So similar to what you would see in a, a saucepan of bubbling soup. I'm told miso soup does this very well. Uh, but you can see different convection cells and material moves upwards in the center and down at the margins. And these two models have been um, used to explain some of the observations we've seen on the surface of Europa. Uh, but neither of them have been able to explain everything we see. And that's been a big problem for us. Uh, but with the new model that Brittany and her colleagues have put together, we can now explain pretty much every geological observation that we see surrounding chaos on Europa. So it's really sort of come along and, and joined together a lot of dots. So we're, we're very happy uh, to see that. Um, next, I want to talk about the distribution uh, of chaos and its age. Um, if you look at this image uh, of Europa, you can see that uh, the surface looks very different from, say, the surface of uh, the Moon or Mercury. Um, those bodies are very heavily uh, impact cratered. They've got a lot of cratering scars on them. Uh, whereas Europa, you can see, has uh, hardly any. In fact, I'm not sure you can even make any out at this scale. Now, we use the number of impact craters on the surface of a body as a proxy for 